1986, and Nancy Reagan taught me to say no to drugs. Has anyone ever tried to sell you children drugs? Stevie Wonder taught me not to drive drunk. Give me your keys. And the Casio SK-1 sampling keyboard taught me how to rock. That Christmas, the SK-1 was an engineering marvel. For literally $75, you got a full-fledged four-voice synthesizer, including a pretty great piano sound, and of course, the ability to sample 1.3 seconds of any sound, Come on, Ruth. Ruth. Got it. and play it back anywhere on the keyboard. Pine needles and presents soon gave way to the return of the school year and the mimetic powers of the Casio SK-1 quickly became the stuff of prankster legend. It also made it the synthesizer of choice for our frequent home recording sessions. While the other kids were out drinking beers and smoking weed, we were busy making the dead milkman look like Mozart. Whoa, like a solar eclipse. And then there was the obligatory thrash metal version of Hava Nagila. songs were recorded by jamming a cheap gem electronics microphone into the front of my Fisher home stereo system, then arranging everyone in the room Motown style. The SK-1 played a vocal stab, go, 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 go. or we'd sample notes off the guitar and use the SK-1 as a kind of synth bass. Hit it. Hit it. Vocals were a cross between the Beastie Boys, and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. While we were busy giving Prince a run for his money, I was also putting a lot of effort into my guitar playing. I'd started playing in eighth grade, but despite the enormous popularity of rock and metal in the 80s, quality, cutting-edge instruction was actually pretty hard to come by. The environment was intensely competitive, with dozens of local bands out gunning for each other. and the serious players were highly secretive when it came to technique. At the same time, the ads for Metal Method, a mail-order home study course for metal guitar, were ubiquitous in the back pages of guitar magazines. Like everybody else, I picked up a couple Metal Method cassettes, and within a week, Doug Marks, the series creator, had taught me how to make a bar chord. quickly graduated to the studying guitarist's full-time occupation, copying licks off records. 
And in the mythical Coke versus Pepsi wars of Randy Rhodes versus Eddie Van Halen, the records I reached for were made by Eddie. No disrespect to Randy, this was just the way it was in the 80s. You had to choose sides. But much like the Yale-Harvard game, this was a war that only insiders cared about. In reality, Eddie and Randy were both astounding players. In spite of their supposed competition, these two icons were much more alike than different when it came to fighting the enemy. I'd been playing piano since elementary school, and I could already cop most songs off the radio just by listening. Upon commencing my program of guitaristic thievery, it didn't take me long to attain a basic command of rock rhythm playing. But comping high-speed solos by ear was a different story. This was really tough. I still remember rewinding licks and Van Halen solos dozens of times, not really sure what I was hearing. And the problem was speed. The typical rock guitar solo was just too fast to hear individual notes. up inventing my own bastardized versions of the things I was hearing. I knew it wasn't correct, but the more I practiced this kind of stuff, the better my finger speed actually became. And one of the most iconic expressions of finger speed in the 80s was one of Eddie Van Halen's signature moves. By simply reaching over with his right hand, Eddie could actually pluck notes directly on the fretboard without a pick. With two hands tapping together, he created swirling, evolving textures that sounded amazingly more like a synthesizer than a guitar. If Michael Jackson had the moonwalk and the Iron Shake had the camel clutch, then tapping was the perfect embodiment of Eddie's famously impish creativity. He became so good at weaving tapping seamlessly into his more traditional playing that you could never really be sure just how he was producing the stunning variety of sounds you were hearing. So pervasive was Eddie's influence as a tastemaker that tapping became a compulsory technique practically overnight. It got to the point where you couldn't take a glamour shot with your axe if you weren't at least pretending to be tapping and tapping and tapping upside down. Even players who weren't known for tapping were tapping. The stunning simplicity of Eddie's innovation had unleashed such a torrent of interest in left hand finger speed that it literally begged the question of what was going on with the other hand. Picking. 
One of the main uses of fast picking in 80s metal guitar was to repeat a single note indefinitely. The effect is called a tremolo, and the genesis was technical. On bowed instruments, a note could be held by simply drawing the bow across the string. But on a plucked instrument like the mandolin, notes died out quickly unless they were continually restruck with the pick. This repetition wasn't a perfect substitute for the smooth, unbroken sound of bowing, but was instead a kind of impressionistic approximation. And along with tapping, the use of the tremolo was jump-started once again by Eddie Van Halen, who featured it prominently in his Watershed 1978 guitar solo called Eruption. Eddie went on to use the tremolo in numerous Van Halen songs and solos as another signature technique. But perhaps Eddie's most recognizable tremolo appeared in his hired gun solo in Michael Jackson's Beat It, where millions of MTV viewers heard it as the sonic climax to the famous Switchblade showdown. When it came to execution, the crux of most technical debates was whether the picking motion should originate from the elbow or the wrist. I practiced this enough to get a basic amount of speed going, and before long, I too could do the Van Halen tremolo thing reasonably well. Part of what made the tremolo easy to learn is that the left hand was relatively static. The whole exaggerated quality of the tremolo came from the fact that the right hand was intentionally picking each note multiple times. But as soon as you attempted to move the left hand and the right hands together, that's when things got difficult. Parts of Eddie's repertoire relied heavily on this, like the awesome acoustic guitar solo, Spanish Fly. Eddie's incredible scale playing on Spanish Fly involved super fast passages where both the left hand and the right hand moved in high speed synchrony. The Metal Method tape actually had an exercise for this. It was a pattern for the left hand that involved all four fingers. Down, up, down, up, and so on. This type of picking is called alternate picking because you're continually alternating between downstrokes and upstrokes with the pick. And it is, of course, the same technique used in the tremolo. The difference was that in this case, each pick stroke in the picking hand was matched up with a different note in the fretting hand as a coordination exercise. Which was great, except I just did not have the patience. I'd practice this metal method pattern for 20 minutes or something. I was pulling my hair out with boredom. The idea that I would do this for weeks on end, really slowly, then increase to a slightly faster tempo, then a slightly faster tempo, well, I much prefer jamming along to my record collection. It was way less disciplined, and as you might imagine, way more fun. This simple fact meant that I did it a lot and got good pretty quick, without ever really thinking about practice. That is, until one day, I was taping Fingers Metal Shop. Fingers Metal Shop. A Long Island heavy metal radio show. When I heard this. The riff was so punishing and aggressive and dark. It was immediately intriguing. And then... Oh my god. Yeah. 